people with sharp eyes will notice that our songbook has grown. Yeah. Hold it this way and you can see white pages, which is, we've got nine new songs in 108 pages. YC, who put this together, was so pleased to, to pencil in 108 on there. She thought that was magical. So if we could please turn to page 20. It's, we're past time to start, and I know folks are lined up at the bathrooms and people are still coming up the hill, but to, because we have songs, <coughs> we can use music to provide the filler while everybody arrives. So those of you who are still in line, don't, don't hurry, don't feel you need to rush. We'll be slowly getting going. We'll be hitting a rhythm as, uh, as the days progress through the week, and it'll all become clear how to do things gracefully, efficiently, for maximize the intake of Dharma and the creation of blessings. Page 20. She carries me, she carries me, she carries me to the other side. We usually do it twice. She carries me, she carries me. She carries me to the other side. Okay, those of you who don't know this, this is a song to Guanyin Bodhisattva written by a Canadian-American songwriter named Jennifer, Jennifer Berzon, who really, really has the spirit of Guanyin. And we only recite those three words, she carries me. Ta Dao yin wo, ta du wo, uh, in Chinese, Dao bi an, to the other side. And uh, this song is, um, has Guan Yin's spirit. She is a boat, she is a light, high on a hill, in the dark of night. She is a way, she is a deep, she is the dark, where the angels sleep, high on a hill, where peace abides, sing the lyrics there, monk, she carries me to other side. Here we go, your turn. She carries me, she carries me, she carries me to the other side. She carries me, she carries me. We do it two times. She carries me to the other side, and though I walk through valleys deep, and shadows chase me in my sleep, on rocky cliffs I stand alone, I have no name, I have no home, with broken wings, I long to fly, she carries me to the other side, here we go. She carries me, 
she carries me she carries me to the other side she carries me she carries me she carries me to the other side thousand arms, a thousand eyes, a thousand ears to hear my cries. She is the gate, she is the door, she leads me through and back once more when day has gone when death is nigh she carries me to the other side last time here we go she carries me she carries me she carries me to the other side. She carries me. She carries me. She carries me, she carries me to the other side. People report that they have taken that song out into other groups and other situations. And when you do, if you do, don't let it slow down. People turn it into a dirge. She carries me. Because it's, it, uh, there's a sense of devotion to it. And when it slows down, it can get murky. So don't. Keep it keep it brisk, and it really touches the heart. Thank you, Jennifer Verizon. So good morning, everybody. Uh, all of you who are eaten by bears, do not raise your hands, right? <laughs> Did we lose anybody? Head count, you know. Um, this is the morning lecture part, and I notice I'm not wearing my name tag, and I told everybody to do that, so I'm breaking my own rules. Um, we're going f from 8.30 until 10, right? And it's important that we um, <coughs> stop this session on time. It's easy to, to run over because you kind of just about um, about a quarter to 10, uh, the food starts to cook on the stove, metaphorically speaking. That is to say the conversation gets good. It always works that way. You kind of slowly build up momentum and then we sort of wake up and, and we get very interesting uh, topics just about the time to stop. We're going to stop because uh, the Greeks, those of you who attend Dharma Realm Buddhist University will know that the Greeks had an ideal which is a sound mind and a healthy body. And the Chinese mirrored that by talking about one and wu, right? One wu, bai guan. And so um, it's important that we move our bodies. And if we go along in the discussion, it cuts into the exercise. And the exercise stops at, it's only 50 minutes for exercise. So please remind me, little ground rule, we want to stop uh, when, when it says. We're going to stop at 10. Um, then there's a, a brief break to go get your yoga mat or to put on your shoes for tai chi uh, or wushu and uh, meet outside. So that's that's the ground rule. Um, does, before we actually start with the sutra, let me ask if anybody has anything you need to report about, is there anything that is crucial about 
the accommodations last night? Anybody has, uh, is, is there your, your roommate in the tent? Uh, some just, you know, stung by a bee and puffed up like a balloon, something? Nothing like that happened. Good. Okay, in that case, by golly. The great flower garland scripture of the Buddha's expanded Mahayana teachings is next this morning. This is the 11th chapter of a very large collection of the Buddha's words. Why are we opening a 2,500 year old book this morning? The answer is, so that the Buddha's voice can be heard. Somebody will be critical and say, actually, the Buddha is not speaking there, Dharma Master. It's correct. It's not. It's, it's someone speaking on behalf of the Buddha. Everybody have one who wants one? Kolba. Okay. This is a conversation. Chapter 11 is a conversation between between two bodhisattvas. One is named Foremost in Wisdom and the other is named Manjushri. Manjushri Bodhisattva, he is foremost in what? Wisdom. wisdom. Correct, wisdom. Foremost in wisdom. Manjushri Bodhisattva was a Buddha before and actually was a Buddha before six times and is about to become a Buddha for the seventh time. How about that? So I guess once was not enough. It, being a Buddha is so good that you just don't want to not become a Buddha again. It's the becoming the Buddha part that is the good part, right? So currently, Manjushri is appearing as a Bodhisattva for another reason, because um, that's where the need is. Being a Buddha is finality. You're you're there. You and the universe are one, and you can't manifest in forms that can actually go directly to help this living being. You help them in a different way. And so the Buddha that was Manjushri said, I want to come back and directly help them. So Manjushri was a Buddha. So that's kind of hard to swallow. And that's any scientist in the room will say, well, show me the charts. You know, I'd like to see the the assert the results, the, the tests. And my answer to that would be um, this the the way we're looking at this text now at the Berkeley Monastery, where we lecture on it once a week, and at City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, where we lecture on it once a week. Not this chapter, but different chapters, is that this is essentially a how to manual. This is a DIY, right? A do-it-yourself Buddha-making manual and Bodhisattva-making manual, particularly Bodhisattva in this case. This is a, is a, a book of instructions as, in, in an interesting way, as dispassionate, although very compassionate, this is as dispassionate as can be. When you see it that way, what the sutra becomes is a manual of the evolving mind and nature. This is a story very much in terms of a textbook story of what happens to a human being when they practice Buddha's dharmas, plural. Right? If you think of the dharma, the word fa actually in Chinese is a really good translation for dharma because fa means to imitate. Yao fa ta imitate, to, to become, to, to do what the other ones do. And dharmas, that's verb, but if you take fa as a noun, it comes out a lot like English cookie cutter, right? A cookie cutter. So if the idea is, here is all this cookie dough, this is Buddha cookie dough or wisdom cookie dough, and you put the cookie cutter of a bodhisattva's practice on top of the cookie dough and out comes, pop, here comes the bodhisattva's form, shape. Another word for it would be M-O-L-D, not like bacteria, but mold, like cookie mold, like, uh, 
what do you say, um, when you pour hot metal into it, you mold forms, plastic mold. Guitar builders use jigs to sh get the mold. When they bend the sides, they take the mold and out comes the guitar, you know. So similarly, the dharmas explained in this text are very much that. Here's the shape. Put yourself into it. If you're not enough, add to it. If you're too little, cut some away, subtract some, draw it in till you fit the mold. When you fit the mold, you, you're the shape of every bodhisattva of times past, times present, and times future. That's, I think, why they say, you know, Changju, Shifang, Fu Fa Sang, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha of the Ten Directions and Three Periods, meaning throughout all space and time. They keep coming up the same shape because the molds don't change. Okay? Those cookie cutters are pretty much time and space resistant to change, but that's, that's, you'll go the wrong way if you think about it that way, because they fit and they work. Humans become bodhisattvas, humans become Buddhas by applying these instructions, right? This is the manual for how to do it. And what I want to convey, the reason why I'm going this way to describe it is, it's not fiction, right? It's not a story that somebody thought up. It's not an opinion. This, this book is not written by a scholar to, you know, to contend or to put forth his uh, thesis and then defend it. It's not a, a, well, in a sense it is. Ananda, the Buddhist disciple, reported it, but it's not a witness to something. It's a textbook. It's, here you go, take a couple lifetimes and see what you can make, you know. Um, I'll give you a really quick example of how it works. When you meditate, what are you doing? Right? You're taking a form. You're putting your body into that cookie cutter mold. So it's a Buddha's form, right? And you, oh, that's the way Buddhas sit. What a funny thing to do. You know, we could be out kicking a soccer ball, driving a car, driving a four by over the mountains and not. We're, we're taking on the cookie cutter of the Buddha, bonk, there it is, sitting in meditation. That's one. When you bow, same thing, bow, and you're taking on one of those forms because why? It's not so much the bow is special. It's what the bow does to your mind, what it does to your nerves, what it does to your circulation, what it does to your respiration, what it does to your spirit inside all of that. When you bow, it humbles it, right? And it washes because the blood and the head and the heart are the same, it washes, right? It's what those forms do to you, the human being. Male, same. Female, same. Young guy, same. Old person, same, right? It's what that form does to you is reported on here. It's the Buddhist story about if you do that, this is what happens. And you know what's wrong? People don't. They don't do it. Mostly we take this wonderful sutra and put it in a glass case and bow to it, maybe. You know, cover it with a nice cloth. That's the Abhatamsaka. It's philosophy. It's the highest philosophy in the Dharma. You know, it's like, really, we can't understand it. It's too much Sanskrit, you know. And they don't. And then when you pull it out, you go, oh, man, I want to, you know, I'd like to get wise. Let me see. How do I do it? You know? <laughs> That's the way Sherful gave it to us, was this is meant to be applied. This is a how-to. It's a doc file, downloaded, it's a PDF, downloaded from the support page of the manufacturer of the special device that you're trying to learn to use, right? Or software. Okay, that's what it is. That's why. That's the answer to the question, why do we spend time this week with a 2,600-year-old book, right? Because. Okay, it's chapter 11, and it's called Purifying Practices, and it's an interesting title. We actually uh, share that title with Thomas Cleary, and it's not very often that we, we agree with Thomas Cleary on translations, but uh, in this case we did because the Chinese, ch the Chinese title is what? 
Which of you young, young guys knows the Chinese title of this? Anybody? I, no, I'm not looking at you guys. I know you, you know. Anybody? You're all looking at your feet. I, I don't know your names to call. I know Alex because I saw his water bottle yesterday when I went into the, the, the pit stop. There it was. I thought, who is that? Oh, I'm glad he came back. And he came back and found it. If I'd known that was you, I would have grabbed it for you. So we had a lost water bottle saved yesterday, right on time. Anyway, I know Alex's name. I'm not going to look at Amitabha or, you know, or anybody there or Leo because you might know the name. What's the name in Chinese? It's called... These smart guys know here. Okay, your turn. Anybody know? Jing Hung Pin. Correct. Okay, that first word in Chinese is Jing, fourth tone. Everybody say Jing. Jing. Good. For, no, not Jing. It's Jing. Jing. Ru Shang. Nigga Jing. Okay. And Jing, this is, it's often translated as um, pure, kind of as an adjective. And we're translating that word as a verb, as a gerund with the ing. When you add the ing to, to a verb, it becomes what's called a gerund. G E R U N D. That's a grammar word. And what it means is, in action, in process, happening now, right? To say, oh, it is a pure practice is, it's like somehow it's on the shelf already and it's static, you know. But purifying is really the nature of this text. It's, we're doing it now. And what are we purifying? We are purifying xing, only in this case, <coughs> excuse me, it's not, it's hung. Because again, it's a noun and verb. Chinese is neat because it's the same word can, can be both a thing and an action, which is a very philosophically satisfying concept. So hung, in this case, practice, means those molds, those cookie cutters that we were talking about, the things we do, like sitting, like meditating, bowing, you know, doing yoga and tai chi and wushu are also hung, they're practices. And then pin is a chapter, and this is chapter 11. And let me put it in the context of the sutra. The sutra happens when the Buddha says, sutra time. And out come these lights. The Buddha releases light. And the light, now it's, you know, would you see it in the sky here in Oregon? Maybe, maybe not. If you're a bodhisattva or a deva or a spiritual being and you have that kind of vision, you see the light and you go, Sutra time, let's go. We want to be there when the Buddha explains the sutra. So he, that, that happened. And the Buddha explained this, this sutra in a variety of places, multiple places. So that's interesting. But here we are in chapter 11, and what has happened is all these bodhisattvas have arrived. There's a huge audience surrounding, and they say other Buddhas come to celebrate, bodhisattvas come to learn, Spiritual beings come to, to find out how to get liberated and, and uh, how to draw near the power source, which is the Buddha. And disciples show up, you know, people looking like Jin Fan Shi, uh, I'm sorry, Jin, Jin Chuan Shi, and like Jin He Shi, people looking like that. You know, bhikshus come to, to carry forth the Dharma. And uh, it's a big scene. It's an amazing scene. And the way they describe it, what do we have? We have rock concerts. Right, we've got um, what was uh, their kind of rock concerts have become so mundane. Back when I was a youth, back in the day, we had Woodstock, mm -hmm. and Woodstock was half a million people in a farm in a pasture uh, with the stage, and nobody had ever in America had ever gathered that many people together for one event before in peace and harmony, celebrating music and being together. And the Buddha's Dharma assemblies, the way they're, <coughs> when they're, we have descriptions of them and then we have artists who tried to paint them. And the scene, there, when you paint it, it's like two-dimensional, right? There's, there's this way and that way and there's flat. But if you can imagine adding that third dimension, if the Buddha's Dharma assembly took on the depth that it has, um, it would be spectacular. Um, it might look a little bit like 
Buddha Root Farm up here on the mountaintop because it's pure here. Um, very few traces of humanity here. And if you, if you really sit still and let your awareness kind of fill the space here, you realize all the life going on around you. When you just look here, you know, trees, <laughs> that's what you see. You look up, sky, okay, trees, sky, grass. Okay, but if you go take a square inch, and I, I'm going to recommend some of you guys do this, and some of the girls do it. Take a square inch of the forest and sit still and look really carefully. Just, just you be quiet and watch. You can do it at the creek too, but not by yourself. Take a buddy. We have creek policy, river, river policy. We'll, we'll come up with that probably at lunch today. You, uh, loudly, you don't go to the river by yourself. The, yes. Yep. There is poison oak. It's not poison ivy. Poison ivy is an East Coast phenomena. This is poison oak. But it'll definitely get you. Um, but most of all, you don't go alone. Okay? Yeah? Uh, this year, uh, because there's so much rain, the river is higher. So we actually didn't cut a pathway to the river because of the fire circulation. To keep people away. Okay. Okay. That's safer. You don't go to the river. <laughs> not alone at all. Okay. So um, rivers are neat. I really like rivers, and we have a very nice one here. But we don't want to find somebody's body floating, you know, face <laughs> up. You know, I'm sorry, sir, your son's dead. You know, no, we don't want to do that. So, and that can happen because rivers do that. You know, it's, it's a foreign environment for your lungs. You, you can't breathe when there's water in there. But my point to tell you is go look at a square inch of turf and see the life. You won't see it at first, but you look closer and you don't move. And then you'll see a little, little beetle. And then you see little white things the beetle is chasing. That's his food. And then you'll see, you know, something on the underside of the leaf that you didn't see. And you'll see, oh, there's two of them. That's the mom and that's the dad. You know, there's a couple down there. And then you look and something will fly down. And then, then you'll see that the you know, part of the leaves are decaying and about to die, and there's new leaves just being born, you know, and it's suddenly on this little square inch of turf in the forest, there's infinite life. There's worlds within worlds within worlds going on right there. And that's the 3D of the Buddhist Dharma assembly. Only the beings there have already got one thing figured out, which is if you study the Dharma, you get better as a person. All those beings in the Buddha's 3D Dharma assembly have come there because they share one thing, which is love of the Dharma, wanting to learn more of those molds, more of those techniques, more of those cookie cutter methods for becoming the shape of sages and arhats and bodhisattvas and Buddhas. That's what brings them together. And the, the Buddha's Dharma Assembly is a, it's a polyglot, man. It is the United Nations of spiritual beings. And it's, it's interfaith, interspirit to the extreme. There are ghosts there. And there are, you know, flesh and blood devouring yakshas, demons there. And there are devas. And what do the devas do? When the devas come, they make music. They spread their, their joy through, through making incredible sounds. And they toss flowers in the air for the Buddha. The devas are full of blessings. They're humans who have been reborn in another level. And in that realm, there's access to everything. And so they, they share it. So when you see devas, they're always playing music, making offerings buzzing around on their little, um, uh, what, hybrid, hybrid air cars or all electric air cars. Locke here, Locke's got a, a Volt. He's got an electric car. Anybody got a Tesla? So these devas are up there with their Teslas zooming around, you know, not polluting, right? So, and uh, they get uh, how many miles per charge up there? I don't know. They're working, they're, there's an upgrade, 200? How many? A lot? 
So Deva, Deva cars probably have a more efficient fuel ratio. But anyway, they, they're a lot like drones, maybe. What do you, I don't know. So Deva's drones going up. So here we have the Buddha's assembly gathered to celebrate this. They've come for this. That's what they've come for. So it's kind of comforting to think, you know, we all gathered here from all the different things we could be doing with this week and all the things we set aside and we came as far away as Malaysia and Mexico and Berkeley to come to learn from the Buddha. Now, his um, method of teaching the Buddha actually didn't speak the sutra directly, and that's really interesting. It's one of the features of the Avatamsaka that the Buddha, uh, he, he spoke two chapters out of 40. The rest of them, he invested bodhisattvas to speak. So this, he gives his energy to others to, with inspiration to speak up. That's, that's how this came about. It's not from the Buddha's mouth. Um, and before, let's see, before chapter 9, <coughs> there's a lot of preliminary things that go on before chapter 9, including lists of worlds, um, lots of poetry, lots and lots of verses and praise, and the Avatamsaka gets a bad reputation of being a philosophical text and too lofty to understand. And it's probably because those early chapters, which are a lot, they, they describe the geography of the heavens. And in the north direction, there's a world called such and such. And in the northeastern direction, there's another world called such and such. And in the eastern direction, there's another world called such and such. And in the southeastern direction, you know, it goes like that, all around the compass, above and below included. And people get that far and put it down. They close it and say, let's do the Amitabha Sutra. It's short and it's easy. You know, Let's do the Heart Sutra. It's short. And because Master Hua, because Shurfu said it's you need this sutra. He said, if you're someone seeking wisdom, somebody seeking liberation, if you want to figure out what's the best way to be a human being, take this as a mirror. Look into this mirror. You will see your face more clearly than any other text available. He says, you know, you can't be without this book for even a second. He said, if you're seeking wisdom. Okay, I'll take it from Shurfu. So that's chapter 11. What happens between the, geography, the cosmic geography chapters and this chapter is 10 bodhisattva leaders show up, right? We're in this place where the Buddha or the bodhisattvas are describing how worlds come into being. It's a creation text. It talks about cosmic worlds. And then ten, uh, ten leader bodhisattvas, shi, shou, pusa. Shou is the word for head, right? Like to in Mandarin, shou. And what it means is leader, foremost among blessings, foremost on virtue, foremost in wealth, foremost in wisdom. All these shou, pusa, show up. And in this case, it's sure it's zhi shou, wisdom, foremost in wisdom, wisdom leader, bodhisattva shows up. And can we, let's do something here. By the way, um, we didn't request Dharma this morning just to save time. Time is precious. We're going to do the Dharma request at night. Okay, well, the morning lecture will just start with a song usually. But one of the things that we want to do, open the cover, please. Let's do Namo Fundamental Teacher Shakyamuni Buddha three times and then do the verse for opening the sutra. Okay, here we go. Ready? Namo Fundamental Teacher Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo Fundamental Teacher Shakyamuni Buddha. 
Namo Fundamental Teacher Shakyamuni Buddha. Together, supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in a million eons, but now we see it, hear it, and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Okay, palms together again. Let's do this three times. Homage to, ready? Homage to the great flower garland scripture of the Buddha's expanded Mahayana teachings and the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Again, homage to the great flower garland scripture of the Buddha's expanded Mahayana teachings and the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. One more time. Homage to the great flower garland scripture of the Buddha's expanded Mahayana teachings and the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Super. Okay. Uh, purifying practices. This is an ongoing translation and people will see on the bookshelf Dr. Wang, you see on the bookshelf right beside you, everybody, Nam, uh, there are blue and brown. The brown is Chinese and the blue is English. That's the second shelf. Yeah, right there. If anybody wants to read the Chinese, anybody who wants to see English can use, but that is an earlier translation. This is an improved translation. That has the advantage of Shurfu's commentary, which is a big advantage. Okay, the blue one is published by BTTS. It's called Pure Conduct. And the Chinese is that in Chinese. Okay, the brown is that in Chinese. Okay? Yao kan zhong wen de ren, you zhong wen de, zhe ge jing wen, jing wen, shei yao kan Okay? Yeah, so, and those are available, just if you take one, please don't take it away, because other people will want to want to read it. Which one has The brown. 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 Okay. There you go. And you're going to have to page through, because it's got lots of commentary, if you want the text. Okay. So, what has happened is the Buddha has gone to, anybody remember where this is lectured? Is it the, uh, uh, it's not the Suyama heaven. I didn't m remark that. This sutra was explained in different places. So, maybe Shurfa will exp say so in the blue, yeah. So, the, the Buddha traveled in different places as to explain this text. It's a long text. And everywhere he went, he gave the, the authority to speak to different bodhisattvas. What happens is, from the ten leader bodhisattvas, one of them comes forward, Pusa, and he did what somebody will be doing tonight, which is uh, taking incense, walking around, bowing down, getting on one knee, and Qing Fa, requesting the Dharma. Saying, Buddha, will you please, we're all here, we're ready, will you please explain what you want to, what, what we can learn, show us what we can learn. And in this case, wisdom leader Bodhisattva asks Manjushri a question, and the entire chapter is the answer to that question. So this is a conversation, right? Anybody who studied Plato, right, know that, that Plato teaches in dialogues. It's question, it's Q&A, basically. This is a Q&A. But what is he asking? That's what's interesting, and that's what makes the chapter worth studying. So we picked this out. Um, of all the different things we could talk about this summer at Buddha Root Farm, we picked out this chapter, and we explained it last year as well. But we, we went slowly to give a real feel for it last year. We're going to pick up the pace a bit this year so we can finish. So you'll have a real good sense of what this chapter contains. What's it about? And what I would like to do with everybody right now is recite together. Uh, yesterday on the bus coming up, we had fun uh, 
listening to people's stories about how they came to Buddhism. What, uh, what happened in your life that kind of told you that Buddhism was there to be studied? Was it grandma, you know, lighting incense and chanting every morning? Was it going to a temple with your, your family? Was it seeing a monk or nun in the East Asian library at UC Berkeley, like I did, seeing a Buddhist nun walk in the library, a Westerner? Uh, what, was, what was it that brought you to the Dharma? And Mai yesterday mentioned that she, what she liked about going to the city of 10,000 Buddhas was Buddhist sutras in English. Buddha Root Farm. Buddha Root Farm. Yeah, Buddha Root Farm. Buddhist sutras in English. You're holding an English sutra in your hands, an English translation. And it's easy to go right past that and think, oh yeah, well, duh, you know. But it's a big deal because they didn't exist in English before. There weren't any. This is because Master Hua said, we want the Buddha's voice in this country in languages that people can understand. So I'll explain it, you guys translate it. And we did. And it's an ongoing, that's the ing verb, right? The purifying. This, the blue book there is an earlier version. And we've, to my mind, improved it. Other people may disagree. There will be people in the future who will improve this one, right? We hope. You know, it might be these guys sitting right here, these girls sitting here. We don't know who's going to do the, the next round. Um, most important, I think, in that process is that we put it in our hearts. Put it in our mouths, put it in our eyes, and chew on it a while. Look at it for a while. Run it through your, your reflection process. You run it through your your image makers and your connection makers and see what it means to you. That's really the point. That's what makes it all worthwhile. Okay? So, what we have from page, these have page numbers? Yes. From page five, no, page three, from at that time over to page seven, so page three, four, five, six, seven, what we have are 110 questions. 110 questions. And the rest of the sutra, the rest of the chapter, those four line verses are 110 answers. Manjushri answers all of the questions. So we get the dialogue that way. And what I would like to do with everybody right now is um, I went through and made categories out of these. And I'll point out as we go. Okay. We'll go down. Let's start and go down to how does he get karma, a body, speech, and mind that is guided by foremost wisdom, which we run into right over on page four. Um, I'm okay, thanks. I'll, I'll be, there we go. Okay, so can we start with uh, chapter 11, Purifying Practices, and we'll just do it together in unison. Ready, here we go. Chapter 11, Purifying Practices. Here we go. At that time, foremost wisdom, Bodhisattva, ask Manjushri, Bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, how does a bodhisattva get faultless karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get non-harming karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get blameless karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get indestructible karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get non-retreating karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get unshakable karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get supreme karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get pure karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get undefiled karma, a body, speech, and mind? How does he get karma, a body, speech, and mind that is guided by foremost wisdom? Okay, to there. Great. Okay. Um, 
Shifu, what Master Hua would often say, there's a dharma for everything. Um, we don't want to luan lai, you know, we don't want to just mess up. There is a, a method and a dharma when you're cultivating for everything. And let me suggest that we're going to be reciting together uh, numerous times this week. And there is a dharma, meaning a method. There's a method, another translation of fa, right? Fa not only means cookie cutter, but it also means method, how to. The method for reciting, whether you're in a city of 10,000 Buddhas, like we will be next week reciting the, the Pumanpian, or whether you're uh, just in, a, in the line for morning ceremony, walking around, the method for chanting is to listen as much as you chant. So you use your ears and your mouth at the same time. How do you do it? You have to make sound. If your sound is too loud, so all you can hear is your voice, you can't hear the person behind you or beside you, you're too loud. Right? If you can't hear yourself, you're not chanting loud enough. Okay? And if you're listening to the person beside you, in front of you, behind you, what you're listening to is their breath. You may not hear it that way, but you are. You're hearing their breath come out, ah, with sound, right? So what is it about breath? Chanting together like we just did goes really, really well when our breath is in harmony, right? Fab is going to be leading us in yoga in a bit, and yoga pays a lot, a lot, a lot of attention to breath. And as we recite, if we are aware of the breathing of the people around us, when we chant, we won't be going faster or slower. I heard some voices going faster. Maybe we're not confident with our English and we were want to make sure that we get it, so we went too fast. Other people weren't reciting at all. Both miss the opportunity to turn this entire hall into one breath. And if we're listening to each other, we can. And that's a really transcendent moment. So that's the fa of, of reciting, is to listen as you make your sound, you're also aware. And when you're reciting together, first of all, your voice drops, right? You're, mm, oh, that's right, I am breathing, that's right, yeah, let's breathe. And then, then you realize past every sentence there's a chance to breathe. Here you go. How does he get supreme karma of body, speech, and mind? How does he get pure karma of body, speech, and mind? How does he get, you know, that space in between, if you're listening, that will be a place to digest, right? The mind takes a bite of sutra, and we also take a bite of the air, and it's a very wonderful experience. So there is definitely a method for reciting. And the answer is both put out sound, use your mouth, and take in sound, use your ears as you go. Okay. Now, foremost wisdom bodhisattva spoke. Jirsho Pusa was the speaker, and we just put his words through our mouths. How, how fun is that? Foremost in wisdom. And Manjushri Bodhisattva is there listening in. And what did he want to know? He said, disciple of the Buddha, they're both uh, on the same rank, you could say. So, Fodzi, he says, child of the Buddha. I think Cleary translates it as Buddha child, which is, I guess, cute. Buddha child. But it's not, it's not it. It's, it's student. Fodzi, the Buddha's son, yes. But if it's son, then what about the daughters? The Buddha's daughters, well, other, same problem. So, disciple, student of the Buddha. Student of the Buddha, how does a bodhisattva get faultless karma? And then he specifies body, speech, and mind. Okay, what do we learn here? Karma is, is the word, and it's, it's ye, and it means action. People really misunderstand karma a lot in kind of the, in the, in the marketplace. 
karma pretty much. If you go down to Reedsport and uh, stop 10 people and say, give me a quick definition of karma, um, most of them probably will say something close to bad, you know, or even they'll say bad luck, or some will say fate, or some will say bad juju, you know, it's like, uh uh-oh, bad karma, right? And that's a mistake. That's needless. That's actually inaccurate. That's not the way it is. Karma is neutral. It simply means action, but it implies action and results. So it's both yin and guo at the same time. It's not simply action because the, the, the dharma way, the dharmic way to look at action is that every, it's, it's also, you know, Newton's way uh, of looking. It's, it's Newtonian physics way of looking. Every action implies the reaction. Okay, so that's the right way to look at it. There aren't seeds always have in them the potential to grow a tree. You know, have, eat, if you pursue the apple all the way down to the core. Anybody eat apple cores? You guys eat apple? What do you do with your apple core when you're done? You chuck it, recycle it, plant it. Anybody ever like go further into the apple core and pull out the seeds? Apple seeds taste really interesting. They're really, really, they're like, apple seeds taste like almonds. They're super like that, you know. So that seed inside your apple core, you don't know it, but there's an apple tree inside your apple core, right? Mostly we just kind of go, you know, chuck, you know, a little bit more. Uh, but inside there's an apple tree right inside there waiting for you to take the seed out and plant it. Where'd the apple tree come from? That seed, right? Tell me it's not in that seed. It's there. You just have to add the ing yet to cultivate it right and then you have an apple tree okay so karma is that it's an action but there's the result implied how do you get action with your body in other words things you do speech things you say and mind things you think that don't mess up how do you Act in a way that is free of error. No mess up, no blame, no boo-boos in your behavior. That's what the Bodhisattva wants to know. Why? There's a reason why he's asking this. And this section, why do we stop at um, karma that is guided by foremost wisdom? It's because this is the section of the questions, right? I I printed them out. You can see them in a little different orientation. These are the questions, right? All of that and all of that. Look at the questions he's asking. There's a hundred questions here, right? And these questions are a bodhisattva's questions. Here's what he's doing. What, when you define a bodhisattva the way Master Hua always did, he would say, what are they? You don't come from Manchuria. In Manchuria, that's jiao. It's not jue. Good, good. You wake yourself up. You wake others up. You take yourself out of suffering. You take others out of suffering. And you bring benefit and good stuff to yourself and to others. The point of that is what? Self first. These first questions, if the Bodhisattva cannot get faultless karma, body, speech, and mind, he is not able to do or li others either. Any, um, who's old enough? Marion, Marion's down working. And Marion's there. Marion's there. Car- you again. I'm going to pick on you again, Marion. Carlos Castaneda, right? Yeah. The teachings of Don Juan, right? Anybody else? I think there are probably only two of us in the room. Okay, good. 
Drew does. You guys know. Okay, Carlos Castaneda. All right. Two of the Hispanic fellows there. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Carlos Castaneda was an anthropologist who wrote about a Yaqui Indian medicine man. Y-A-Q-U-I, Yaqui, the Yaqui Indian medicine man, named Don Juan Gennaro. And Don Juan was probably in the Buddhist world, he would be like a Taoist recluse, or he would be like a, a shaman. He's clearly a shaman. He would probably be up on top of Huangshan somewhere, you know, in a cave. So people like Don Juan existed in China for sure. But um, Don Juan, could, he was called a brujo, and a brujo is a sorcerer. He's a medicine man. And he could transform into the body of a crow. The crow was his familiar. He could fly, you know. He, he knew how to uh, put herbs together, including magic mushrooms, of course. And uh, he was, you know, a, a, a magic person. He, Don Juan takes on the Carlos. Carlos is kind of writing in the first person, but we're not quite sure who the guy is. He takes him on as a student and teaches him all that he knows, or a lot of what he knows. But the key word is, if you want to become a warrior, says Don Juan, you have to be immaculate. That was his word right? You have to be immaculate, which I really like as a translation for purifying. It's a much better translation than pure. Pure people think ivory soap, you know. You think pure, I don't want to be that. That's just too boring, you know. But if you say immaculate, meaning faultless karma of body, speech, and mind, that's what the Bodhisattva wants to be. He wants to be immaculate, why? Because if he's still got his issues, how can he possibly teach anybody else? So the first thing the Bodhisattva wants to know is, how do I become immaculate? How do I get my stuff behind me so that the Dharma works through me perfectly? Right? That's what he wants to know. That's what makes sense of these first ones. Okay, let's take a look at what he asks. He says, I want to be faultless. In other words, no mistakes. I don't want to make any mistakes. In the words I say, the things I do, or the thoughts I think. Isn't that interesting? So what's in there is the notion that he's aware that he easily can make mistakes, but Manjushri knows how to teach him how to not make mistakes. Okay, suppose you're a doctor. Suppose you're an acupuncturist. Suppose you've got somebody's pulse under your fingers, and you're there, and you're... Boom, 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 and you can tell all the different pulses, and you miss something. Maybe the heart pulse is slippery like a rope. Maybe the liver meridian is sluggish, right? Suppose you miss, and you misdiagnose. Oh, how would you feel? You feel terrible, right? That was Master Hua. Master Hua memorized 11 medical texts, but he said he was... He was was only his, his fear was that he would make a mistake. So what that did was it really made him very careful. Made him very careful. And here's our bodhisattva in exactly the same place. He says, I know I can make mistakes, but I want, if I learn really well, I will be faultless. So I always do it right. That's, our bodhisattva is right there. You know, he's a good doctor in training. And being a doctor is truly a situation of ho dao lao, shui dao lao. There's always more to learn. You never learn it all, you know, because there's always new diseases coming out. So how could you learn it all? So here's our bodhisattva practicing like a good doctor, saying, I want to be faultless. I want to really do it right. So how do you get karma, a body, speech, and mind that doesn't hurt, right? Let's, let's stick with the doctor analogy. When you become an MD, you take what's called the Hippocratic Oath, which is not the same as hi hypocritical oath. No, don't hear it wrong. No, Hippocratic Oath. And what the Hippocratic Oath is, no harm, right? A doctor can kill. A doctor can make you really sick, right? If he chooses to, of course he wouldn't. Why? He says, I will use my skills never to harm. So here again, our Bodhisattva is 
is in training as a good doctor, a good acupuncturist, good herbalist. How does he get blameless karma? I want to behave in a way that no one can find fault. Nobody will blame and say, your fault. I want to get indestructible karma. That is to say, the things you do last. Right? The things you do have stature. I was watching our, our bus driver yesterday, Michael. Michael was the guy who took us from Williams all the way here. I was sitting right behind him so I could watch him. And Michael was in a conversation. I don't know, you guys in the back probably didn't see this. He was in a conversation with all the other cars on the highway. Oh. He was, and somebody would cut him off and he'd go like that, you know. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, yeah. I like, like yeah. why'd you do that? You know, <laughs> and blame, right? Because he had standards. He's a professional driver, very proud of how he takes and, and very fast. Michael, oh boy, he <laughs> ran that bus like a car, like a yeah. sports car. Doom, 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 you know. <laughs> and he was always right on, I, I drive and I, I know when you, if you, there's a curve and if you get to the limits of the physics and if you go five miles faster, you're going to be off the road. He would always take it right, just a little soft of that and go around at the edge, you know, and testing the, the mechanical bus to make sure that it, you know, take it to the Im limits, but every car that passed, and it was really funny. I, we were just about at our turn off onto 138, and I was, I was watching, I, I didn't know the name of the, the turn off. I forgot it over the years, and uh, Sutherland, S-U-T-H-E-R-L-I-N, and uh, we were coming up and I was reading the signs because I was gonna say to him, oh, it's up ahead, Michael. And I noticed that there was a turnoff, and so this motorcycle cut in front. And I said, "Michael, do you need to do you need to use the rest stop?" He says, "I saw that motorcycle." He thought I was criticizing his driving, for and I was no, I was thinking, "Would you like some coffee?" You know, and he was so he was so tuned in to his driving and so much in the relationship with everything around him that he interpreted my comment as a critique of his, the way he responded to that motorcycle. You know, I thought, whoa, I didn't, I'm, you know, no, 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 you know, you're, you're doing it just right. <laughs> so how interesting, right? Why? Blameless. He, he has standards and he, he didn't, didn't, he knew he didn't merit being blamed for bad driving. What do I call that? Unshakable. That's to say, everything he did, he stood behind. He was responsible for every action and unshakable. And just think if we did everything that way, you know. We'd never, like, play practical jokes on people. We would never s gossip, because gossip can't stand, you know. Don't tell her, you know. That's what, why do you because you know it can't stand. It's shakable, right? The Bodhisattva wants unshakable karma. How do you get supreme karma? Karma that is behavior, let's translate behavior. How do you behave in a way that is above, you know, just above everyone? How do you get pure karma? Karma that has no spots on it, no deviations, no stains. And then undefiled, karma that is, another way to think about that is um, chemists, when chemists reduce a compound to the essence, how do you get it down to that absolute uh, essence where it is just the element itself, no admixture? And then how do you get karma guided by foremost wisdom. Wouldn't that be nice? So that everything you do has wisdom as the goal. And what is wisdom? Mm, that's, you know, that could be our week. If we, in, we could do this whole week on one word, wisdom. We have to do it on wisdom and compassion because wisdom doesn't exist, this kind of wisdom, without compassion. It's the flip of the hand. But how do you define karma guided by wisdom. And the wisdom, I think, is 
first of all, there's multiple wisdoms. There's jnana wisdom, which is knowledge-based. So you acquire knowledge, right? Yi, by day it, it grows by day. And then there's prajna wisdom, prajna paramita. And the prajna wisdom is another kind because it's got two different levels. Prajna opens to emptiness. That's what's unique about prajna. And when you have emptiness, then everything's gone. And what was formerly true is now, you see it just, it just came apart. You, you see all the pieces of it, the conditions, and yet it's still there at the same time. So prajna wisdom has two levels. It's got chen and shi. The chen is, is it chen? Chen. Dishan, Chen, Dishan, Yarshan, Chen, 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 let's see, what is it? Chen, 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 Di, Shi, Di. The Chen, Di is the, is called the uh, conventional or um, provisional. Given certain things, given the conditions, it's true. But the Shi, Di, the ultimate truth, these two levels of truth, says fundamentally it exists only while the conditions are there and it's gone. So the Bodhisattva with Prajna wisdom sees that all the time. Things keep falling apart right before him. Things fall apart. And you can see it, you see the emptiness in it and they don't stop. They don't quit. That's the Bodhisattva. Right? Prajna Paramita is the, probably the signal uh, hallmark teaching of the Mahayana. You don't find Theravada monks talking about Prajna Paramita. They talk about Panya. But that is often uh, transformations of consciousness that come after Samadhi. It's not at Prajna yet. That's why, by the way, people who are going to study Nagarjuna and Irigare with uh, Doug Powers and Dharmaster Hung Chur at Sudhana Center. Anybody signed up? Couple? Few? Yeah? Good? Okay. You'll be, uh, when you get to Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna is the, the teacher. He's uh, after the Buddha. He's one of the disciples. Nagarjuna goes into uh, Prajna Paramita and out the other side. He takes it to what's called Madhyamika. The, the ultimate teaching of the middle way, Zhong Lun, Long Shu Pusa. He was an amazing, amazing teacher. And he explores this aspect of where the real, I'm looking at the camera right now, but the camera is a piece of technology that's this baked plastic and glass and metal and titanium and, you know, spaces and copper and silicon with the, the, the coating going in the wires and, you know, all of that come together. We say camera, you know. No, it's not. It's actually, there are these, uh, I'm a, I, I read camera blogs. I'm a photography blog reader. I have my favorite photography blog writers and, and I make comments on those photography blogs because I'm interested in the technology of cameras. And sometimes they'll saw it in half. They'll just take a really high speed saw. <laughs> go right through the camera so you can see what it is. And it's all these wafer elements stacked up in the body of the camera. And every one of those came from nature ultimately, right? And you can analyze the camera right back to Turtle Mountain. And then you put it all back together and you cleverly have a factory that makes the plastic body and the glass lens and if you go, uh, the, the Sigma Lens Company, this is a bit of esoterica, you heard it here this morning, make note. Sigma Lenses uh, is a family-owned company up in the north of Japan. And Sigma, it's, they make these bizarre, wacko cameras and lenses that, you know, the cameras in particular, they never sell, but they, they just keep making them because they love them. They, they make them because they like them and they can, you know. And they have this beautiful video on their website 
of how a lens comes into being, right? Camera bodies come and go. It's the lenses that are the real prizes. And where do lenses come from? They come from sand, right? Glass. Glass comes from sand. So they take the sand and they show how they polish it down into a lump. And then they have this incredible machinery that makes the lump flat but curved at the same time. It's flat and it's curved and they grind it in the perfect way and they coat it in the perfect way and it comes out into this lens and you look through it and the world goes light, right? You see light and it's sand. You know, pretty astonishing how this all works. Anyway, so that's to say prajna wisdom can take this thing, this device, and run it back to emptiness and then bring it back. So it's both provisional and actual at the same time. It does that to everything. Now, why do we care about that? Why talk about it? Suppose somebody is insulting you. Suppose it's your significant other, your spouse. Suppose it's your husband. Suppose it's your fiancé. Suppose it's your boss, right? And that person is trying hard to get you angry. Suppose it's your dad trying hard to get you angry. Now, your dad wouldn't be doing that, would he? Suppose it's your kid trying to get dad angry. There you go. Okay. And they just know exactly where your button is, where you're we, and they know what to say, the overall, right? And you listen to them, and you just kind of smile and sigh and go, no, no, that's actually your problem. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> you know, because why? You appreciated their emotion or their feel of the issue, but it doesn't, you know, that button has now been pushed so many times, it's, you know, it's disconnected to the, to the power source. You just kind of, you know, you upgraded that button and it's now no longer, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they can't get you angry and you are, what? In control. You're powerful because emotion didn't move you. That's the application of prajna wisdom. The reality is there, but it's empty at the same time, and you see deeper. If you have prajna wisdom, you see deeper. There's one for the notebooks, right? Prajna wisdom lets you see past the surface. You see deeper, and it doesn't bug you like it used to because you saw, yeah, it's actually, it's, it's not about me. You're you have something in your mind that is reaching past your body and mind out into my world hoping to get a response. And it could. That's an option, but it's not today. You know, not today. So, wow, that's powerful. That's prajna wisdom. Okay, the Bodhisattva says, how do I get karma of body, speech, and mind guided by prajna wisdom that sees the emptiness at the heart of all conditioned things? That's what he wants. And when he sees that, what is he able to do? He can teach you. Bodhisattvas are contracted with living beings to teach them. What's a bodhisattva about? He's out there trying to help people hurt less. That's what bodhisattvas do. They try to make people hurt less. So, doctor, right? There we are again, back to the doctor. What is a doctor? The doctor wants people to hurt less. They give their lives to learning how to make people hurt less. What a noble thing to do, right? Bodhisattva does that, not just for the body and spirit, but for the entire being. Who hurts the least? Probably a Buddha. But on the path to Buddhahood, there are a lot of tears. Right? We saw Master Hua crying many times. Imagine you give all of your effort to have somebody leave the home life, right? But they can't stay a monk or a nun. And they fall away. And your, it's like your child jumps back into the ocean of suffering. You know. So how does that feel? Anyway, the Bodhisattva is devoted to helping beings hurt less. He must get himself out of the ocean of suffering first before he can do that. That's what the first chunk of this text is about. 
We'll now, on page four, everybody got page four? Um, and we're going to go down to, let's see, inexpressible wisdom. Okay, perfect. Uh, ready? Here we go. How does he get a perfect birthplace, silence, listen with your ears, lineage and family? How does he get physical perfection and a perfect appearance? How does he get perfect mindfulness, wisdom, and practice? How does he get perfect fearlessness and perfect enlightenment? How does a bodhisattva get supreme wisdom, foremost wisdom, superior wisdom, supreme wisdom, incalculable wisdom, inconceivable wisdom, incomparable wisdom, immeasurable wisdom, inexpressible wisdom. Stop. Okay, good. Um, that's, you can pronounce it incomparable, but it's incomparable. Hit the com. Incomparable, right? So the parable is, is, is unaccented. It's just like immeasurable, incomparable, inexpressible, like that. Okay. So uh, this next, these next two paragraphs, look at what he wants. Think about, okay, you're the bodhisattva, let's say. You're about to go out to help people hurt less, and we're talking about your mom. We're talking about your auntie, your grandmother, right? We're talking about your pets who are ill or whatever. That's your job. You're contracted to help them. And what do you need? How do I get a perfect birthplace? How do I get perfect lineage means ancestors, so xian, family, your current family. Now, implied in this is the idea that this is something you can choose. Interesting, huh? This is set into the idea of multiple births. This is not a system that says once around. You only go around once in this world, grab for all the gusto you can get, right? That's the marketplace that says that. That's Budweiser beer that says that, right? It's not the, uh, the Avatamsaka Sutra. This is set upon the idea that we come back and we come back and we come back. So next life, when I have a choice, how do I get a perfect birthplace? Where would that be? Anybody who says Los Angeles, you haven't lived there right? <laughs> What's the perfect birthplace? Taipei. Obviously, it's Taipei. Shirlin, right? Hawaii. 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 Well, that's pretty close. Okay. <laughs> How about over here? What's the perfect birthplace? Where would it be? Hawaii. Buddha root camp. Buddha root camp. <laughs> <laughs> Smart guys. Over here, where's the perfect birthplace? Western Pure Land. Western Pure Land. Oh, that's a studied Oregon. answer. Oregon. Goha, where's the perfect place to be born? Nikoishren, this is the Jonali. Pure land? Okay, she means it. That's from the heart. I could hear it. Okay. Uh, Liz, perfect birthplace? California. California. She lives in New York. That's why she says California. Where? Heaven. Heaven. Ah, from a Buddhist point of view, that's an inaccurate answer. <laughs> right? Why? Heaven is not an ultimate place. You come back out of the heavens at some point. That's what they say. But you're not, not too far off. Okay. Perfect birthplace. I want a perfect birthplace. Give me a perfect birthplace, please. Lineage and family. And look, you want perfect hair. <laughs> Physical perfection. You want a perfect complexion, right? Yeah, you want to be cool. You want to be the homecoming queen. What? You want to be <laughs> Mr. X, right? You want to be who? Oh, man, I know who you want to be. Steph Curry, right? Physical perfection. Perfect. Who's got a perfect appearance? Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? No, no. Have you seen Arnold when he was at his peak? He's... His muscles have muscles. There's, there are these pictures of Arnold when he's like at his bodybuilding peak. It's like, he can't be that big. It's as if somebody like attached a pump to his biceps and went <laughs> like that. He's just 
how could somebody be like that? My goodness. And he was the governator. Yeah. yeah. How do you get perfect mindfulness, wisdom, and practice? Now it moved inside. It's not outside, but he wants this. How do you get perfect fearlessness and perfect enlightenment? Okay, if the Bodhisattva gets those things, he is, she is ready to teach, right? Then, look, all these different kinds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Didn't have to ask. I knew it was ten kinds of wisdom. This is the Abhatamsaka, and it always comes in tens of things. And this Bodhisattva knows what he wants. He wants wisdom. She wants wisdom because why? She needs it to teach. She needs this wisdom if she's going to look at a situation and know what's needed in order to bring it back to harmony and to encourage that living being to wake up. Okay. You ever question? Are you Alex. Saying that my blue Bodhisattva has more wisdom than four than apparently foremost wisdom Bodhisattva? It's well, it, I could say that, but it... These names make lots of sense. He may be what? He doesn't like the names he likes switched around. Well, Man, okay, here's, that's a good question, because why Manjushri is f- number one in wisdom, and here's a bodhisattva named Foremost in Wisdom, so it's like wisdom, wisdom, you know, wisdom facing off with wisdom. We could have a tag team match, you know, who's got the greatest wisdom? So... I mean, that's a good question, but of all the great bodhisattvas, Manjushri is known for his wisdom, too. So probably it's about the same. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> well, he is in other times. That, that's his name. They say, uh, So, good question. Yeah. He wants wisdom because he needs it. If you, um, how many people... Um, have been. I just thought of, I don't know if I just thought of an answer. So Go ahead. Actually, for a lot of us, names for the monks, we get names that, of the places we need to work on. <laughs> you know, so like you want to learn something, so you get those names. So maybe this is what he, he wants to aspire to. Could be. The name of God, the foremost wisdom, he wants to learn foremost wisdom. Could be. Yeah, that's what he's aiming for. Yeah. So, um, if you can imagine a situation. Where, oh, how does that, what's the poem? Is it Invictus? What's the poem? Boy, Boy Scouts know this poem. Where, if you, my son, can keep your head when all others around you are losing theirs. What's that poem? Uh, Is that If, Rudyard Kipling? Yeah. Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, right? Then, my son, you will be a man, a Boy Scout, uh, a boy, a man, you know. You'll be a Girl Scout. No, uh, That poem has the thought, if you can be somebody who, in a situation of great chaos and calamity and potential disaster, if you, at that time, keep your stuff together and you know what to do, that's what the Bodhisattva wants. He wants wisdom. Wisdom knows what to do when stuff goes south, right? I remember, um, and this is the last thing we'll say because it's time to stop. Um, Time went fast, huh? We're having fun with the Dharma. That's what they said about our translation. So I remember there was a time when uh, I was in a um, student council meeting. I was a, a senior in high school, and I was the student council president in name. But uh, I think it was our first meeting, and People were, you know, we hadn't become a team, the various student council officers and and such. And we had our first meeting, and it was in the big auditorium, and, you know, we couldn't really hear each other, but we were trying to, I was trying to be presidential, you know, and and what a joke. And a fire alarm went off. And it it wasn't a scheduled fire drill. Somebody had actually pulled one of the fire alarms. And... There was, uh, there was, you know, chaos because nobody knew what was going. What's that? What's that? And it's, it's a really loud fire alarm in this auditorium. It was really loud. And uh, I watched people around. They were engaged in 
whatever they were doing and started to panic. And I didn't panic. And it was funny. I had, it was one of those early moments of self-awareness. I was, what, 16, 15 or something. And I, I started, you know, I said, okay, uh, the closest door is out the back. Everybody go out the back now. That, that's the shortest exit. And started uh, telling people what to do. And my first thought was get people out. And I remember uh, finally I, was, I walked out at the last and we were all standing out on the lawn, you know, figuring out what, was, what had happened. And then I started to, trem to tremble as my adrenaline, you know, left me then. But I didn't say anything. Nobody noticed that who was, who was giving the orders. But I, it was probably the first time in my young life that I saw myself. I stepped aside and said, did you do that? You know, that w other people were panicking and, and that's what people do in emergencies is they, they lose their wits, you know. And I don't think I've ever told this story before, but I remember that moment of like, okay, now out, you know, let's get out. There's the exit. And, and I had the microphone and directed everybody out. And that's the, the kind of awareness on the spot that a bodhisattva wants. And I had no idea where that came from or what it was all about, but at that moment. Now, in the next situation, I could easily be the first one to panic, I suppose. But at that moment, it was like, oh, huh, maybe that's what it means when, you know, you say when other people are losing their, their wits, if you can hold on to yours. So, if you want to see somebody lose their wits, you want to go out to the little brown bunny rabbit that has been under the tree during this entire lecture. You can't see him yet. You have to go out there. There's a little brown bunny rabbit that's been running back and forth and back and forth. And as soon as he sees us step down onto the lawn, you're going to see a panicked rabbit. He's going to... He's, he's got, it's a short-eared rabbit, not, not a Texas Jack rabbit, longhorn, not one of them, you know. This is a little short-eared brown bunny, but he's, he's been out there. And, and uh, he will happily observe your Taiji from afar, right, from the safe, safety of his own burrow. So um, you will see rabbits, you'll see deer. We will have, in the evening lecture, chances are there will be deer walking around. You'll be able to see them. Probably won't see any bears. I wish we could promise one, but yeah, you know. The berries are going to be ripe soon, and they're not interested in people. I think the berries taste better than we do. So, Okay, appreciate the time that you've devoted to the sutra, and I'm already five minutes late. See how it happens? That last story took us past it. So let's do our exercise to uh, 10, 50, 10, to when? 10.55. 10.55. People recall yoga in this room, Tai Chi with Marion out here, and Wu Shu Kung Fu with Locke out here. Mm -hmm.